Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Uh, today, I'm delighted to talk again to Dr. Abdullah Ali. You're most welcome, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. How are you, Paul? Alhamdulillah, very good. Uh, it's, it's evening here in London. I think it's the morning in California where you are. Yeah, 10 30 a.m. <laughs> nice and bright, right and early. In the evening here is dark and gloomy, unfortunately. Winter is <laughs> setting in, very depressing. Um, for those who uh, I don't know, um, very few people left, but just to introduce you, uh, Dr. Ali is a professor of Islamic law and the prophetic tradition at the famous Zaytuna College in California. Now, according to the prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, all prophets warned of the Antichrist. This includes information about the sort of powers the Antichrist would have and would employ to deceive and enslave humanity. Accordingly, he would have helpers and be supported by an international system which facilitates his rule. Is it possible to know which people and organizations are consciously working to create this oppressive order? And what can Muslims and others do to resist? And how close are we to the appearance of the Antichrist? And this is a very topical subject, I think, on many people's minds at the moment. Um, and Dr. Abdullah Ali has kindly agreed to give a talk today, uh, which he has titled Reality Distortion, Understanding the Tools of the Dajjal, that's the Antichrist. So over to you, sir. Inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, rabbi al-Mim wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Yes, um, thank you once again, Paul, for um, bringing me back on uh, for this extremely important topic. It's, it's uh, an important topic for many reasons, as we know, and especially in light of uh, recent events happening around the world. Um, it's, it's really, I guess you say, increased, um, uh, cause increased interest or rather it should, in my, in my viewpoint, should it, it, it can sort of pique our interest in focusing on this particular topic. Now, uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, as you have already alluded to, uh, he mentioned in the hadith that um, every single prophet, or there's not a single prophet who had come who did not warn of the false messiah, uh, al Masih al-Dajjal. Um, and um, he also said in one narration that, uh, you know, between the creation of Adam and the occurrence of the hour, there's nothing more serious or greater than the matter of the false Messiah, Masih al-Dajjal. Ma bayna khalqi Adam, ma qiyama sa'ati akbar min amr al-Dajjal. There's nothing greater than that, you know. And so, and it's interesting too, when you look at the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum ajma'in, that uh, they took the words, uh, the Prophet's words to heart. And when they learned things about the Masih al-Dajjal, they uh, look to see if they can find signs or they can identify people in their midst who actually might, you know, fit the bill, you know, as we as we say. Uh, and so one particular uh, boy um, who actually uh, lived in Medina, he was a young Jewish boy named, named Abdullah ibn Sayyad, um, he piqued their suspicion. You know, so because, you know, they looked at his physical form, the prophet talked about how, you know, his eye would have some type of a deformity with respect to it. Um, he seemed to be somewhat of a clairvoyant. Uh, and uh, while the Prophet ﷺ was there with them, naturally he told them uh, that, you know, if he were to appear in, in his midst while he was with the, uh, the, the companions, then he would be their advocate against them, that he would be their defender against them. You know, but of course in his absence, then every person will be his or her own advocate. Um, and so the Prophet actually tested this young boy. Uh, now, of course, the only reason I'm, I'm mentioning this is because um, uh, the fact that the Sahaba, that they were interested in identifying uh, who uh, and what may uh, be a portent uh, of the hour or a sign of the hour, uh, that that in itself should lead us to do similar things. And we live in a time where once you start to speculate about these sort of things. And of course, speculation is can be very problematic, you know, especially when you speak in very certain terms about them, you know, so. Yeah. It, um, it's, it's quite conjectural, isn't it? It's, some of this can be conjectural, what one's not, not based on certain knowledge, but nevertheless, it can be informed on, right. uh, 
speculation, I guess. Right, exactly. You know, and 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 you sometimes you may be right, sometimes you make a mistake. Um, and so that needs to be understood from the very beginning, you know, is that, but at the same time, you know, if we do believe that these are things that would, will occur, will happen, um, then we definitely need to have the concern for trying to identify where such people may eventually appear, uh, who are the helpers of those people, um, are there things that have already happened um, in our own lives that are indicative of sort of a consolidation of power which will make it uh, possible for them to see the jail to actually uh, to rule, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's important also to reflect upon the fact that we call him the Antichrist, or the, of course, in the Islamic tradition, we call him al Masih the Jal, which technically translates as the the false Messiah. Um, but you know, it's the Antichrist. You know, and so the Messiah we have to reflect upon what the Messiah even rep represents. You know, mm -hmm. in order to really fully understand what. Uh, potential powers um, the the false messiah will eventually have, and so for instance, we learn uh, that, or we would think of the messiah as sort of like it's this king prophet, you know, who's going to come at the end of time, who's going to rule the world, you know, by God's revealed law, and he's going to create a situation or usher in a situation. Of course, a law is going to create it, but he's going to usher in a situation where the humanity will actually live. Um, in peace for the first time, you know, and this is prior to uh, the the last hour before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to destroy all who remain on the earth and take all the believers from the earth prior to that, that moment and then bring uh, or rather leave the most wicked of souls on the planet prior to the blowing of the trumpet, right? And and so we find in Hadith of the Prophet where he says that Asa bin Maryam uh, that he will come he has a just ruler right you know hakam and adla right that that the allah will send him as a just ruler you know he salib he will destroy the cross right which is understood to mean that he's going to come to clear his name of all the blasphemy committed against him that he's going to destroy any symbolism which actually uh indicates that he's either god or the son of god you know the yaqtulu khanzir he will kill the pig which we can understand to mean that he's going to I did literally, right, he's going to literally destroy pigs so that it will not, not allow for people access to committing the haram anymore because not only the Muslims, uh, not only Muslims prohibited from eating pork, but even they, their own books, you know, also the, the Bible itself, you know, has the injunction as we know, right? And so, so because this is nearing the hour, that this is a time rather than where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided that no more waiting, no more opportunities is only an ultimatum for all, all humanity, right? And that is to embrace God, right? You know, and then it goes on and says, well, that he will he will abolish the tribute. You know, and, and so so Ulama understand this in one of two fundamental ways. One way is understood is that that the it means that Isa bin Maryam uh, is going to not accept any uh, tribute from an individual who is not a Muslim who wants to pay it in order to maintain his or her religion, right? Why? Because God uh, is is God is coming, right? You know, as you know, of course, we mean this in you know a metaf metaphorical sense, but like God, His day is coming, and and judgment is near, and so now there's only one of two choices: either you accept uh, a God. Or you accept damnation, right? And that itself may entail you losing your life, right? So, so that's one way that particular statement is understood. Another way it's understood is that fundamentally there will be so much wealth on the earth at that time that anyone who offers charity to another will find it difficult, if impossible, to find someone who's willing to take it. Why? Because no one would need anything anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So there would be no longer any reason to tax. To tax anyone, right? Taxes really won't have any point at that moment in, anymore, right? And so, so, so that's again our understanding of the 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 true Christ, the the real you know Messiah, right? Mm -hmm. The true Messiah. So the Antichrist, you know, in a similar fashion, is coming to rule over the world, right? To 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 establish tyranny, and this is what the Prophet ﷺ talks about: how the the Messiah, uh, the uh, Asa bin Maryam, when he returns at Islam, that. He's going to restore uh, justice to the earth after it had been filled, after it had been become filled with injustice and tyranny, right? Right. right. So, in other words, the entire earth will be 
filled with injustice and tyranny. Now we live in a time where we see tyranny in certain parts of the world, but in many parts of the world, we don't really see the, you know, the tyranny, right? But fundamentally what this is saying is that a time is coming where the entire world will be engulfed or covered in tyranny, right? Mm -hmm. And it's gonna be because of the system and the tactics that have been utilized by this individual who we know as the the antichrist right and so so if again uh if 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 he if Asa ben is uh, you know similarly he's going to be abolished tribute he'll probably also abolish it as well but he's going to place a condition on it as well and so when we look in the hadith we'll find a hadith where we you know we're gonna you know I'll come to some of those things inshallah uh okay. very soon which uh highlight some of these points that i'm trying to make right um but um Perhaps what I can do is uh, I'll, I'll yeah open up my uh, PowerPoint. So so this is a hadith that mm. uh, that I started with. I mentioned you know that there is nothing greater happening between the creation of Adam and the onset of the hour than the matter of the false Messiah. Um, in another hadith, the Prophet he said that whenever one of you recites the shahad, the, the tashahud. Right. And of course, we know we recite this in our every prayer. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the most prayers is twice, right? We recite at tahiyyatu lillah, zakiyatu lillah, tayyibat salawatu lillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Right. And so, so during or after the recitation of the tashahud, the Prophet sallam, said that one should take refuge from four things: min adabi jahannam, from the punishment of hell, wa min adabi qabr, from the punishment of the grave. From the trials of life and death, and then fourthly, to take refuge from the evil of the tribulation, the evil or the, the, the evil uh, that comes from the tests of the false messiah. In other words, uh, we pray five times a day. Uh, we recite the, the tishahud in, on average twice in our prayers. And the Prophet ﷺ wanted us to take refuge from the Masih Dajjal. This is how concerned he was about it, right? That even during our prayers, during the prayer, we, 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 we pray to Allah, we praise God, you know, we send salutations on the Prophet and the, the family of the Prophet and Ibrahim, the family of Ibrahim. But we also are being encouraged uh, to, to pray or take refuge from the evil that will come from the Masih Dajjal, right? And this is something uh, that Muslims have right. practiced since for more than 1400 years, right? You know, that we seek refuge. You know, so it's, a, it's an enormous event, an enor enormous thing to come, to happen. Why? Why? Because this is a man who will be difficult, who actually, you know, will have great um, uh, influence and power, right? So as mentioned before, the true Messiah will fill the earth with justice after it was filled with tyranny, uh, but also he will come to destroy the cross, kill the pig, abolish tribute. Uh, and also there will be so much wealth that those willing to give will find no one willing to accept charity. Now, of course, another part, another aspect of his mission is that he's going to be the only one who's able to actually kill the false messiah. That that's one of his missions to come back for that. And we learned in the hadith that he's also going to marry and he's going to die like normal people, uh, according to the majority uh, of the of the of our scholars. Um, a score, a majority interpretation. Now, the false messiah is the opposite of that. We've talked about that just a minute ago. Now. This is something I think often Muslims uh, are unaware of. Well, at least most Muslims are unaware of is that there were, there's a minority um, or was a minority faction among the Muslims in the early period. And there's still some Muslims today who actually believe that the hadith with respect to the return of Isa bin Maryam and the Masih al-Dajjal first and foremost are false, right? Uh, that, that there are still some Muslims who actually believe that, right, today, extreme minority of them, right, you know, but there, it goes back, you know, to early period as well. You know, there are some who say that, okay, well, the Dajjal, if he does come, um, that uh, any powers that he apparently has actually won't be miraculous powers, right? There are scholars who actually help the view. Ibn Hazm al-Zahiri is reported to actually help this view. Uh, some of the a minority of the Mu'tazira had this view, uh, in other words, they say the Dajjal is real, but his powers are not, right? The majority of our, mm -hmm. our, our scholars uh, and in the mainstream beliefs of overall majority of our theologians throughout Muslim history have had the view that, yes, no, no, he's both real and he will have 
miraculous powers on top of that, you know, because we learned, okay, that you give command to the skies to rain, it will rain, he would give command to the earth to grow, and it will grow. But the opposite as well, like he gave the power to withhold rain, the power to turn land into desert. Uh, so uh, there's this, let's talk about a young man that uh, he will kill and slice him in half and then stand between his two parts of his body and then uh, give a one, he sort of wave his hand and then the body will be revived. And it said that, you know, this particular young man, according to some narrations is al Khidr, uh, alayhi salam, um, uh, or a belief that some had, you know, that, that he would be, in other words, signs of some type of miraculous power that he has. But, but to know the real reason I mentioned the opinion about those who believe that his powers would not, would not be miraculous is that there is rather the possibility that some of his powers that he would utilize would not be, um, would not come from rather, we say, uh, a divine source, uh, you know, as we, understand it, you know, that, that he won't necessarily need to utilize some type of miraculous power, right? But rather, uh, there are other tools, especially in the type of world we live in today, where um, you can manipulate and you can deceive, you can create fake videos. And as a matter of fact, uh, of two or three weeks, I think about two weeks ago, uh, I, I saw people, Muslims were sharing a video, which um, it was a video of Malcolm X, a speech of Malcolm X, you know, but it wasn't like a, an actual video of, of his, his original speech. Uh, but it was just simply a voiceover, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And the words were in the sort of like a, um, one of those reels, uh, uh, one of the TikTok type, type of video, yeah. right? But I can tell myself because I've heard so many of Malcolm's speeches. I'm sure you've heard them all. <laughs> right? yeah, perhaps, maybe I have, I'm not sure, but uh, but I've heard a, a lot of his speeches enough to know that that was computer generated. Right. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and so, and I, I highlight, I pointed this out. And I know that a lot of Muslims were like, oh, yeah, Malcolm said this. Malcolm, yeah, he was with the Palestinians. Right. right. And it was a positive message. I believe right. he wrote, I think he wrote about the Palestinian plight. But I've never learned, known of him, of, of a recording of a speech of him giving, giving which actually indicates, uh, you know, <laughs> where, where you actually have a recording of it, you know, <laughs> where, he said these things. So this is this is one on one hand is like people will accept it because all oh, it's positive. It's a good thing. Look what we can do with this technology. You know, we can spread good news. But at the same time, we have to understand that that was uh, uh, something that even during uh, the early period when the hadith of the prophets were being collected, that it was also an attitude that some of the hadith uh, fabricators uh, had in mind. They felt that they were they're contributing good uh, to the community yeah. by making up hadith about the Prophet Muhammad yeah, 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 so. God, that, that's well, well spotted. That's a fascinating example, actually. So the Dijal, by that argument, doesn't need miraculous powers because he can utilize this technology which seems miraculous, but it's not, right. it's man-made, yeah. Right, exactly, right. So, so Allah, I don't know, I mean, but, but the whole point is just that, you know, um, you know, there's this opinion, and yeah, yeah. even without miraculous powers, there are ways to manipulate, there are ways to deceive. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the hadiths of the Prophet mentions that, that, uh, that, that uh, the Dijal has what we call sort of uh, intelligent tricks or shubuhat that he utilizes against his victims, right? Um, and actually, as a matter of fact, I think the next slide actually is, is I'll come back to this one, uh, see if I can find that, that hadith. Uh, uh, yeah, this is the hadith. So in this hadith, it says, uh, whoever hears of the Dijal should keep his distance because a person will come to, come to follow him, thinking him to be truthful in light of the intelligent tricks he is sent with. Right. Uh, another version of the hadith says, you know, that whoever hears of the jail and keep one's distance, um, a person will come to the to the Dajjal to challenge him, thinking that he himself, the challenger, is a believer, you know, but then will actually end up following the Dajjal because because uh, of the shubahat, right? You know, wow. so in other words, there's an appeal to uh, uh, the intellect, right? There's an appeal, great appeal that, that he does to the intellect. You know, of course, we know how the Dajjal can appeal to the Shahawat, or sort of the lower desires, the passions of the human being. Or everyone, you know, I mean, when, when you're, you know, convinced of something, when you are manipulated by your lower passions, 
most people know and understand, okay, well, I know I shouldn't be doing that. This is wrong, right? You know, but I'm so weak. I'm too weak to, and so I could succumb to my desires, right? But when it comes to matters of intelligence, uh, one, people don't like to think of themselves as being uh, docile or, you know. Gullible. gullible. Who, who, wants to, who wants to be thought of as gullible? Uh, right. Is it credulous? Uh, right. Uh, it's just not flattering to our pride, is it? Right, right. Not at all. Not at all. I remember growing up, like in, in the in, in here in the U.S., you know, politicians will all always say, you know, the Americans are the most educated people in the world. American Americans are the most powerful country on the planet. And and of course, it stroke people's egos. Like, yeah, we're no one's more educated, more intelligent than we are. But the average American only knows one language, right? So, mm-hmm. I mean, so how intelligent can you possibly be if you only want know one language to begin with? How much, how cultured can you be? I mean, the average American um, finds it difficult to find any other place on the map in the world outside of the mm-hmm. United States, you know, yeah. but even sometimes even within the United States, right? So, so there is a, it's a sort of a trick that, you know, th- it doesn't require the Dajjal to, to do that, you know, but, but again, yeah, but typically we think of ourselves, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, someone who cannot be duped. I, I'm, I'm not gullible. You can't trick me, you know, but I've been tricked before. I, I feel, believe I've been brainwashed before, right? Perhaps on multiple occasions, right? And, and I'm just being honest about that, you know, so, so if I've been uh, brainwashed, I'm quite sure. And I've seen a lot of other people have been brainwashed, you know, brainwashed, but this is one of his, most important, important. We, we, we tricked, uh, globally we were told once you know the <clears throat> by by the western leadership that iraq you know possessed weapons yes. of mass destruction um we were told in britain that saddam hussein represents an imminent military threat to britain you know within mm-hmm. 45 minutes he could attack us uh, all this was yeah. lies and we now know this and everyone accepts they were lies but everyone believed them or nearly yeah. everyone believed them and yet th- th- these were tricks because yeah. the people who are propagating them didn't have the evidence, obviously, didn't exist. So somewhere someone was tricking us to, into going to war on behalf on behest of some other reasons which we won't go into. You know. Right, right. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that definitely one of those examples. And and I'm actually going to refer later on to uh, some of the organizations which um, contributed or at least believed to have been contributed to that particular deception right you know so and i think it's important for us to actually keep our eyes on those same type of those same organiza- organizations uh, i mean we were just tricked yeah i would say during COVID as well as another thing you know i think it's okay for us to mention COVID on youtube now because i mean they've changed at least for now maybe in another year they may change their policy again but we saw we went through that period where you couldn't even mention anything negative about COVID or negative about the vaccine um, you can't talk about, you know, whether or not people have been injured by the vac- by the vaccine. Uh, they couldn't, we couldn't say anything about the origins of COVID. Uh, the only narrative we're allowed to actually even believe was one uh, about a, 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 the, the, the wet market and eating bat soup, right? And they were told, you know, <laughs> <That's true. laughs> right, right, yeah. That was the only narrative we were told. Oh, I started in a wet market, you know, it did start in the yeah, lab, yeah. it started in the yeah. wet, wet market, you know, so and people were censored in the process of that right you know mm. and, and then people were lied about with respect to even issues of efficacy and you know of the of the vaccine etc cetera, etc cetera. you know so you get we, we we know i mean what what happened so i i, I don't this is going off subject slightly but i just to, to put this in the time stamp i mean we were told by our mm. home secretary here who's just been fired sacked mm-hmm. uh, by our prime minister uh, that the uh, the pro Palestinian marches uh, I went on one on Saturday mm-hmm. were um, hate marches. That mm-hmm. what motivated us was pure hatred. Right. And mm-hmm. This was such a, a slander and a lie mm-hmm. because you know I was there. It, it was almost a family occasion. The mothers with their children. Mm-hmm. Everyone was very respectful, good humoured. Everyone cared passionately for the killings that are taking place. There was no hatred at all, and right. and yet this is the dominant narrative in, mm-hmm. in the media and. Yeah. Um, it, it, and a lot of people will believe it because that's all they're going to hear from the respectable legacy media, so to speak. And it's very hurtful. I found it very hurtful because that wasn't what motivated us at all. And it was just simply a lie yeah. and a very bare-faced one. But that, that's that's pretty raw and ongoing. Yeah, actually. yeah I, don't, I actually don't think that that's, that's off topic. I think it is right. germane to the topic, right? You know, your example that you give, you know, I, I saw uh, a headline yesterday which said, 
the majority of Americans, they took a poll of Americans and the majority of, of Americans have a positive viewpoint of Netanyahu. And I was like, whoa, that's really interesting, right? You know, you know, how could that possibly happen? Right? Mm -hmm. You see, not mm -hmm. saying that, you know, you should hate somebody simply because the TV made you hate, but it shows you how the TV can make you love somebody as well, right? Mm -hmm. uh, among other things, right? So, so again, so, so that is, I would say this is probably most important uh, uh, power, you know, is a power mm -hmm. of, of deception, right, that he has, you know, but there's these other things that we learn from the Hadith of the Prophet, so like with regard to the problems of the Dajjal, you know, so, so what we, and, and, and I wanted to talk about the issue of Pharaoh too, right, because mm -hmm. it's interesting that in the Quran that the story of Moses and Pharaoh is the most oft-repeated story in the Quran. Really? And the Quran being the final mm -hmm. revelation uh, of, 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 you know, from God to humanity, then it, it's as if God is trying to send a message to the rest of us that from this time, from the time of revelation of this book, until God inherits the earth and all there upon the earth, your most significant threat will be uh, government, will be mm -hmm. government tyranny, right? You know, at least that's the way I read it personally. So that's one that's one way you can read it. So, 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 so fundamentally, when we look at the story that Pharaoh, you know, he had his political apparatus, you know, he had a military apparatus, he had economic, and he had his propaganda wing, you know, he had his, his magicians, right? He had his magicians, he had his, you know, Harun, you know, and, and, you know, and Haman, you know, the military, the, the, the Mason, you had, these, these people who are building up uh, the civilization in order to present the idea that this individual actually is truly God, right? You know, and this civilization is God-like, right? And, um, and so it's as if like Pharaoh is the archetype, right? Of all, you know, tyrants, right? Or true tyrants until the end of time, I would say, right? So, um, so, so, but then you see again this consolidation, right? You know, similar consolidation. So he has the consolidation in the media is happening, right? As well, right? Our media, as a matter of fact, um, is a slide here I have about the media. Okay. So, so this is you know our media. This media consolidation, right? And this is somewhat a some somewhat old um, um, picture, you know, which sort of summarizes like a ninety percent of of the media that people they consume right it, outside of course alternative media uh, options which is good to see that alternative media like, like yeah it's an important caveat because because alternative yeah. media is now a major major source of news like twitter uh um, yeah. that's another, plus we come back to that point but yeah yeah right mainstream uh traditional legacy media yeah absolutely yeah, yeah but yeah. the point is this like the, you know and I, and I totally agree there because like i think that Alter social media, alternative media like your channel and, and others, you know, well, you're not necessarily, you know, media because you're teaching, right? Educational, right? But it's, if you think of it as alternative media as well, long form media, yeah. uh, that that this definitely is, it poses a major challenge, right? To the mm -hmm. legacy media, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but to see the level of consolidation happening, that in itself should at least make our, antenn our antennas go up. You know, say, okay, well, why are they consolidating? Why are so many media outlets um, you know, sort of, why do they have the same message? Why do they have the same messaging? Why are they trying to prevent or shut down alternative voices? You know, so if we were to come back, for instance, to some of the things we were speaking about earlier, why were they, um, why were they censoring the voices of actual scientists and doctors during the COVID lockdown? Mm -hmm. You know, those doctors, legitimate doctors from Stanford and, and other places, it's like, well, they said they didn't believe that the lockdowns were the right way. They're not going to do anything. You know, it's not the wisest thing to do. You know, but said, no, 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 we're not going to, we have to undermine and, and challenge and we have to discredit these people, right? And we only want one narrative, right? So the media stepped in, you know, politicians, uh, Hollywood actors and actresses, uh, all of them got involved on the push to to actually, okay, do your part, you know, and then also, so not only to stay at home, but do your part and, you know, getting vaccinated, do your part, right? You know, uh, with something, a new type of technology, a new type of vaccine, new type of technology had not been tested, it didn't have any long-term, 
any long-term, um, um, uh, you, you know, so studies on it. And then they told us, oh, no, no, we accelerated the studies, right? He said, well, how can you accelerate time, right? <laughs> you know, how can you have long-term studies, you know, and, you know, and long time hasn't passed yet, right? But again, mm-hmm. but a lot of people went along with this, and unfortunately, many Muslims did too. So, so, so we see consolidation. So in the media, is this one place, right? You know, and, and if anything, uh, it's one of the most important places to have power, you know, because like, um, was as Malcolm X, you know, one of his famous statements, you know, the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent. And that's power because they control the minds of the masses. I mean, the, 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 this, this, this that quote you just read out is 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 never been more timely. I think I don't know yeah. if it was t- timely in Malcolm X's day, but now it, it really uh, is very very prescient and uh, powerfully spoken. Um, I think totally, totally, absolutely, absolutely. And here's another quote from him. He says, uh, "If you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing." Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Prescient, right? Yeah. And, prescient. Um, so, so we have consolidations on, on like on many levels. So, so media is just one is one level. I'm sorry. Uh, let me make sure I get back to my slide. So, is media is just one level, right, of consolidation? Try mm. to get back to my slide here. Uh, I'll keep going back for some reason. I think I do it this way. Probably. Right. So media. Then we then we have what happening, for instance. Well, I mean, uh, but there's also consolidation in places like, you know, we have like Apple, the App Store. You know, some people are saying that it's a monopoly, you know, that they monopolize you know, the App Store itself and, and, and get in and sort of there's not fair competition there. Amazon has a sort of monopoly when it comes to some of their uh, the video uh, options, um, uh, among other things. Right. You know, so. And really, the only real competition that a, a company like Amazon has is is like Target and Walmart, right? You know, so um, you know, not to say that completely a monopoly, but these are you know, you can think of them as wings of the the media as well, and to certain certain to certain some extent, right? Because they'll threaten uh, your your corporation, your company. That okay, well, if you want to actually uh, place your app on our store that you have to conform to certain rules, you know, that you conform to certain censorship rules, et cetera, right? And if you don't do that, you're not gonna be allowed to be to come on the app store and you're not gonna be able to stay on the app store if you don't enforce the rules that we have. Yeah. Uh, um, we see consolidation happening in the area of food as well, right? So um, there's, I mean, uh, 2000, I think it was 2000, 2001, there was a farm, a farmer's revolt or uh, protest in India, right? And then we've seen the similar protests happening in, um, you know, the Netherlands and other places like that, where uh, there are these people who decided that, in government, decided that, well, cows are bad for the environment, livestock are bad for the environment, uh, your fertilizer is bad for the environment. You know, and we're going to cut it in half. We're going to cut down on these things, you know, so we can save the environment. Right. Um, you know, and so, of course, alhamdulillah, it was good to see, like, the pushback, the protests. A lot of people are waking up, you know, and this is what is what they were afraid of. And I think what happened was that the the, you know, the COVID lockdowns really led to a lot of people waking up and realizing, oh, my God, this is tyranny spreading. Right. Mm-hmm. And so so while you have may have against the false messiah, appearing right and 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 attempting to to enslave slave the population you know you're also going to have the resistance right that's going to come up we promise that as well right they're mm-hmm. going to be on the army of the mahdi they're going to be those who are actually going to uh waiting for the return of isma Maryam to actually push back against such things right there's talk about trying to tax uh, the water. There's, 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 as a matter of fact, you know, if you follow the World Economic, Economic Forum uh, and some of their, their, uh, their online presentations, you'll see that like that one recent video was circulating about how uh, they were lamenting the fact that not enough people are buying into the climate, sca- t- climate change scare that now they need to, well, maybe if we target their water, right? And so I'm talking about yeah, because everybody needs water and likes water and they understand water. Not everybody understands climate change. You know, but everybody, everybody understands water. Right. So we need to tell them something about the water to get them to to understand 
uh, that they need to comply with our particular wishes, right? Uh, you see it in the area of, of medicine, right? So medicine, a medical consolidation, pharmaceuticals, all right? Uh, what happened with regard to Pfizer and Moderna and those type of, you know, so, you know, we, we as we saw how how much in, in, in uh, alliance and they are with the media itself, you know, where people were sharing those, um, those um, sort of those, those videos that were showing how so many um, legacy media outlets actually are being sponsored by Pfizer. Like in the United States, the FDA gets almost almost 50 percent of his funding from outside sources right so it's and of course we can say well perhaps you know it, it looked like pretty apparent that the same people they're supposed to be regulating are the ones donating to them to, to ensure that they get the sort of outcomes and the sort of messaging that they're looking for right and they the cdc all these people were exposed right at least to those who have their eyes open right for those who just have their eyes closed and just say oh well we can trust the government. They don't mean us any harm. They would never do anything like that. But we've already, we just lived through two, three years of some, some great tyranny, right? You know, and, and, and lies being given to us that have been exposed, right? And, and, and one thing I wanted to highlight here too, it relates to the question of what they call SIDS and SADS, right? So mm -hmm. SIDS, mm -hmm. SIDS is a, it, it stands for um, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. And SADS is a sudden adult death syndrome, right? Now, one of the signs of the hour mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu uh, in one hadith reported by Imam Tabarani, uh, he mentions that one of the signs of the hour and yathara mawt al yeah, sudden death would appear, right, towards right. the end of time, right? right? You know, and so it's really interesting that we have these diseases and after the COVID va vaccine rollout, we've seen an increase a significant increase in heart attacks in teenagers, heart attacks in, in, in young, you know, young, young kids who are not teenagers, uh, heart attacks in, in athletes, et cetera, right? You know, and then some one thing, and they call it sudden adult, adult death syndrome, sudden infant death syndrome, you know, so, but, but, they, but the larger point is this, is that uh, the messaging or the, the consolidation, right, in the medical field and in the scientific realm makes it difficult for us to see that there's collusion happening here. Uh, that could happen among a lot of these companies, a lot of these uh, multinational corporations and governments, right? Is in energy, is in money. Uh, so, so energy, we know, I think it's easy for us to talk about energy. Money, uh, I, I would say, if you were going to talk about uh, the top of the food chain, you know, so we have a food chain, right? So the human beings at the top of the food chain, but mm -hmm. among human beings, those who are truly at the top of the food chain are the bankers. The bankers are really those at the top of the, top of the food chain that they can, if you control the money, then you pretty much control everything else. Right. You know, and so, and so to try to understand why we see so much conformity among even politicians in the West, Right, I would say that it has a lot to do with this. Is because there are people uh, that the banks actually have an agenda, and and also in concert with multinational um, organizations like uh, the UN, United Nations, the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, World Economic Forum. Uh, you find uh, other corporations as well that work for them: uh, Vanguard, BlackRock. Um, State Street, these multi-trillion, these big corporations with multi-trillion, about multi-trillion dollar budgets, right, right, where they invest in all the major sectors, right, right, uh, and that grants, grants them a, a major amount of control, right, then I think that this has a lot to do with what's happening. You know, for an example, um, Bud Light lost a lot of money because of the the Mulvaney, um, De I think it's a Devin Mul Mulvaney, um, the, that, those commercials that they were promoting, those adverts. And so people say, oh, Bud Light is gone woke. You know, we need to stop drinking Bud Light. Of course, you shouldn't be drinking it anyway, you know, but yeah, at any rate, you know, people decided to boycott Bud Light uh, because of this, because they had a problem with this transgender man, this man claiming to be a woman and one, and so now Bud Light is jumped in on the action. Target, something similar happened with Target, right? So Target, we're trying to sell, you know, sort of the rainbow, sort of the LGBT style clothing to children. Uh, and so, and they lost a lot of money because it was a major boycott. 
I think what needs to be understood, or at least this is why I understand what happened, is that there is something called ESG. Let me let me just come move up to that. Let's move up to ESG, um, so that we we don't have to follow this in in this in this in the same order. But something called ESG, environmental, social, and governance. You know, so so when you look at the United Nations. Um, sustainable development goals. Uh, they mention, in a, in a, they express it in somewhat different way. They mention what we call sort of the environmental, social, and governance standards, right, for corporations. Uh, and they even say they have a goal that by 2030, <laughs> that uh, that they're going to rid the entire planet of of poverty. <laughs> this is like one of their stated goals, right? You know, we're gonna create peace on earth rid the entire planet of poverty, nobody's going to be starving. That would be nice, right? You know, and again, I think that that's the reason they're able to appeal to people. People say, oh, yeah, who, who doesn't want a better world? Who doesn't want a world without war? Who doesn't want a world uh, where people uh, are no longer starving? Who, who doesn't want a world where everyone has a place to live, right? You know, so fundamentally, they've decided that corporations moving forward, that they have to adjust to what they call their ESG standards, uh, and fundamentally, what this means is that uh, that they re they they change from being what they call stake uh, from shareholder uh, capitalists uh, share shareholders to stakeholders. In other words, anything that they do is supposed to be beneficial to the environment and to the planet, right? And if your actions are not beneficial to the environment and planet, then you're not going to get a good ESG score. And if you don't get a good ESG score, then you're not going to have the same level of support through advertisement as other corporations who actually do conform. And you're not going to have access to other types of money and wealth, right? From the big banks, from the, from the central banks, right? So this is coming from the top. This has come all the way from the United Nations, right? United Nations, you know, the Council of Foreign, Foreign Relations, you know, inter inter interestingly, CFR, which is CAFA, right? But it's, you know, out of Manhattan, you know, that it said that they had a large stake in the actual propaganda that was being promoted to start the Iraq war. And if you can actually look up an old interview, you might be able to find it if you search it. But uh, Bill Maher interviewed the former president of the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, I think his last name is Haas, Haas uh, something Haas, H-A-A-S, I forget his first name. And when, as soon as he came on, Bill Maher said to him, he said, okay, well, uh, we hear that you are actually, the, the, you actually run, you actually part of the organization who secretly runs the entire world, right? And so Haas actually, he, 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 puts, on, he puts on this very, you know, big smile, smirk, ear to ear, and then he shakes his head, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, like yes, yeah, and I was like, whoa, you know, and so, and of course, people in the audience were like, oh, he's joking, you know, but but I think you're serious, you know. It's like that's how 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 powerful they they are, or they believe they are that, that they can come forward and say those type of things. But at any rate, the whole point is that that Bud Light was conforming to ESG standard because a part of that is social. So social is connected to what we call diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right, you have to include more women. You have to include more minorities in your your management, things like that. So they probably said, okay, well, we just do one of these things, you know, and it'll keep our ESG score right, but okay. But didn't realize that there was going to be a large backlash, right? You know, so so in other words, they themselves are even um, pressured, right, not to actually uh, practice business uh, in the way that they actually want to because of the because they believe in the bottom line. And so those in the bigger banks, IMF, the World Bank, and other places like that, that they understand this particular phenomenon. I mean, it really is strange to me that uh, African nations decided that they were not going to conform to the demands by Western governments to accept LGBTQ lifestyle in mm -hmm. normalization. And what happens? The IMF says, okay, you guys are not going to get any more loans. Mm. So, well, whoa, whoa, whoa. When, you're a bank. What, what are you doing in, interfering into people's culture, their, yeah, you know, the, the sovereign, you know, sovereign uh, governments, et cetera, right? So, so it's, 
So uh, the b fundamental point, again, being that these are, again, one of the ways I would say that when we're looking to try to look for those corporations or those people who actually we can see the potential helpers of the Masih al that then, then go no further than the banks, the, the transnational think tanks, right, which are out there, um, again, uh, United Nations, the uh, um, World Economic Forum, Council on Foreign Relations, and similar corporations like that, you know, I personally believe that these are the, uh, the, the, the true helpers of, of, of this, you know, and so what's happened is that over time, so this consolidation happening slowly, mm -hmm. what they do, they'll get us upset about, okay, I don't think that a, a man is a woman, right? And so it created a culture war, right? So, so while we're fighting over uh, whether or not Novani is really a woman or not, wh wh whether or not he's really a woman, you know, they're continuing to consolidate their power, right. right? Buying up smaller banks or they're buying up smaller corporations or they're, you know, consolidating uh, those companies that sell fertilizer or, you know, et cetera, of, of the, the energy, the energy sector. You know, there are a lot of things that, um, that, uh, that are involved here, you know, so, which fundamentally, again, takes us to the question of, okay, is there actually a cabal, right? You know, so, so what, what does cabal mean for those who might not know? Well, cabal, we're talking about a sort of secretive, a secret group of people who actually, you know, who conspire to, to, to dictate the direction of everyone else on the planet, right? I guess that's one way to put it, right? Yeah. So, right. So, um, so this is, uh, this is typically like why people, they don't like to hear this type of talk because we've been programmed, I would say, or being, we've been primed to, to have an aversion to conspiratorial talk, right? Right. I, I remember years ago meeting, whenever I first started to meet people from the UK, I noticed that one thing I noticed is that people from the UK were much more, in particular Muslim from the UK, were much more inclined towards accepting conspiracy theories. Oh, yes, big time. Big time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's funny, it's the opposite. Most of the pop general population, non-Muslim population, are have accepted the idea, oh, there are no conspiracies at mm -hmm. all. Any talk of conspiracies is paranoid, or, yeah. which of course is absurd, because in real life, conspiracies, of course, do happen. We know this, they're right. Fact. But Muslims are the opposite. They they tend to the default position seems to be in the UK anyway. Uh, conspiracy. Yeah. Um, yeah, in the UK it is, and in America, in the US it's different, and in Canada I think it's different. It's the opposite, you know. And I think, and that's a problem, an Achilles heel of our community, because whether or not the conspiracy theory is a hundred percent true, we should not dismiss a theory simply because you know we don't like. You know, we don't like the way it hears. I mean, we don't like the way it sounds, right? We shouldn't dismiss it simply because, okay, it originates from certain people or because it sounds like a conspiracy theory. You know, what I mean, if you're a truth seeker, right, mm -hmm. you're willing to entertain every possibility, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Now, I may not be able to prove or sort of establish a clear line of 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 of, of, of causation, I guess you say, between this thing and the other thing, right? But at least, again, the fundamental purpose I have here is to at least pique people's interest and say, you know what, uh, even if I'm incorrect, we should keep our eyes, we should keep our eyes on these particular organizations. We should keep our eyes on these particular types of uh, people, right? Because they have, they have definitely done things, right? That have caused great harm, right? You know, so- You mentioned earlier, earlier on, of course, the, uh, the, the attack on Iraq, the reason for that, and the, how all the intelligence agencies and the government, everyone just knew there were WMDs. And that was a kind of a conspiracy because it was right. based on nothing. So it had to be yeah. actively cultured and manufactured and promoted in the media very energetically to alarm everyone such that, yeah, yeah we must attack Iran, Iraq rather, Iran, a Freudian yeah. split there, yeah. Right, well, that well, that still might happen. A lot of those best, you know, but they yeah, still they've yeah. been trying that, you know. But, but mm -hmm. and that's and that's you know again, the being sort of primed and conditioned to yeah. Yeah. to accept those type of things, and they take advantage of our of our frailties, right? You know, of our fears, our anger, you know, our desires, our anxieties. They take take advantage of those things, right? You know, mm -hmm. so in every time we get afraid, you know, of course we're willing to okay, we're going to surrender. A certain amount of a certain amount of freedom uh, over to them, right? And they'll continue to take, and they never give it back. 
and uh, so so fundamentally, we have to be very careful about that. And like some people would say this, some people will hear me speaking. I'll tell you, some people in America, in particular, they'll hear they hear they hear this this uh, hear me speaking about this. They'll see the video and they'll say, "Oh, okay, all right, QAnon, oh, uh, conspiracy theorists. Oh, that's because he's a Trump. He's a Trump supporter. That's it. that's why. You know. So in other words, what they what they've done is they've conditioned people to to believe that the the my enemy cannot have anything that is of value. You know that that, that my enemy doesn't you know land on the truth. Yeah." Yeah. At all, right? You know, so it's like, it's, it's, it's okay. Well, oh, uh, you're supposed to be okay. I'm if I'm a Democrat, I'm supposed to be against the Republicans, right? And so if the Republicans are promoting this, then I can't be against. I have to be against that, and vice versa, right? So, so that's one of the ways that they also control people uh, and manipulate us. And so we just have to be people who are willing to fight to have good control of our of our emotions, etc. Right? So here, I want to just read a, a couple. Of things. So this is Hadith. Uh, very popular hadith where the Prophet says, yeah, that there should come upon the people uh, years of great deception or de deceptive years, elusive years shall come before the people, come over the people wherein the liar will be deemed to be truthful, the wow. truthful will be deemed to be a liar, and the treacherous person will be given a trust or will be trusted, and the trustworthy person will be labeled a traitor. The tr trustworthy person will be later labeled a traitor. We had to call them ofiha rawaybida, and the rawaybida they will speak during those years. And then it the prophet was asked, "And what are the rawaybida?" And he said, "It is a rajul tafi who yet to amran amma. He is the insignificant man who speaks about the the affair of the public." Right. In one narration, he called him Afwaisik, the sort of little scoundrel who would speak about the affairs of the public. Another version, that one who is not given any attention, uh, who actually will speak about the affairs of the public. And I would say that this hadith, in terms of the Ruwaybi, the who they are, I personally believe it applies to multiple factions of people, but first and foremost, it applies to the media. I think we're talking about the media who controlled anytime. Uh, you the, the extent of your job is to sit down and just simply read someone else's script, then you're an insignificant person. You're not a person of really value. You can just really easily replace. You are a dispensable person, right? So the prophet said an insignificant person who's going to speak about the affair of the public, right? So you sit in front of the TV camera and someone gives you some words to read, and that's all you do for, for your life. And you make a million, million dollars, or two, three, three million dollars a year, right? You, know, um, you have... Similar, similar to that are Hollywood actors or actors in any country. Same thing. What do they do for their living? They read someone else's script, right? Other than those who actually make their own movies, right? But, yeah. but, but they're, most of them are these people who are reading someone else's script, right? And then we give a whole lot of value to their p position on politics and all these other things when they themselves really, they're not educated in those things most of the time. Right. Uh, uh, and, I, and I, of course, I like to add to that people on social media as well, like the trolls on social media, people who generally they they they're not very important, you know, but they have a they, they feel important because they've been given an outlet to do so. So they opine about every single thing, everything which is possible. Right. And, and again, to be fair, you know, when it comes to me, because people some people will say this as well, they say, well, OK, uh, you're talking all this stuff, and so he introduced you as uh, a as someone who teaches uh, Islamic law and prophetic tradition. You know, when did you become an expert on 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 COVID? When did you become an expert on vaccines? When did you become an expert on banks? When did you become an expert on this or that issue? But what people have to understand is that when I am speaking about these things, I'm not just just opining as an authority on those things, but rather the information and the ideas that I'm expressing to you originate from actual experts in finance, experts in banking, experts in, in the medical field, experts in, you know, you understand what I'm saying? So it's not just like my opinion. I'm just, okay, well, you, know, you may like the opinions of certain scientists. Mm -hmm. I'm persuaded by the opinions of other scientists, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm not the one opining this to the scientists 
who I listen to who are opining, right? Yeah. So that's an important distinction that we have to make. Um, and then here's another hadith uh, where the Prophet Sallallahu he said that, you know, that there's uh, said, uh, shall I not relate to you information about the Antichrist that no prophet before me told his own people? And then he goes on and he says, he is one eyed, not a cyclops, but he has um, an injured eye. One of his eyes is not, uh, not normal, it's not healthy. And he will come and he will have along with them something which is the likeness of paradise and hell. And the thing that he calls paradise is actually hell. Right? So this is what he said about the Dajjal. And then there's a hadith of Hudayfa ibn Yaman where he says, I am more well informed of what the Dajjal has than he himself is. Right? In other words, I know more about his tools of trickery, mm -hmm. etc., than he himself is here. But why? Because he's he's getting information from the messenger Ali So then he goes on and says, He shall have or he has a river of water and a river of fire. And the one that you look and see, you one the one that you see or think is fire is actually water. And the th the one that you think is water is actually fire. It said, so if any of you happen to encounter that and he wants to drink and he wants water, then let him drink from the one that looks like fire. Because he shall find or discover that it is actually water. Right? Now, is this a literal, you know, thing, or is it, you know, is it figurative, right? You know, so there, many of the ulama say this is literal. That literally, he will have a river of fire and a river of water. There's some narrations say he will have a uh, a mountain of 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 meat and a mountain uh, of you know of other things, of, you know, mountain of, of meat. Um, and as an, I can't remember, there's something else. It was slipping my mind at the moment, you know. But he's gonna have these things that he utilizes utilizes to allure people in to attract them. To, to lure them in. So, so another thing it says that he will be able to do is he's been going to be able to command the sky to rain, and he will command the earth to grow as vegetation that will grow as vegetation. So, it said, and an aspect of his tribulation is that he will pass by a town, and those people will reject him. Those people will reject him. But when he leaves, not a single animal will be remain alive when he leaves that town. In other words, compelling people to embrace his 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 his, under, his belief belief in him and his way. Uh, but then also, Right, and then he will also pass by another town, and those people actually accept him. They will believe in him, and when he leaves the town, well, a rain will come. Uh, the, he will order the earth to grow his vegetation, and his vegetation will grow until their livestock, their animals, will become the most um, productive uh, uh, they have ever been. Right, so. So, so to me, again, coming back to this question of whether or not the, the Jaws powers are literal or, or just technological, there is, if we were to consider the possibility that when it comes to this example, uh, that it's not a miraculous power that he has, that there are um, corporations, there are um, um, organizations who actually have powers to control the weather mm. right right that that governments have actually had the power to make it rain uh and to snow for decades right as a matter of fact during the vietnam war the united states utilized crowd seeding in order to prolong the monsoons uh um so that they could overwhelm 
of the uh, Vietnamese soldiers who are waiting for them to come, right? So, and this is well recorded. You can look it up and find it, as a matter of fact, on Wikipedia. In other words, I, I believe it's called Operation Popeye, right? But, uh, but fundamentally, um, um, they've had this power. They do it. China does it all the time. The UAE, they make it rain. They do things that they make it snow. You know, so in other words, and, and they also have the power to transform, uh, you know, very fertile land into deserts too, right? So, so maybe the situation is one that he he wants you to do his bidding. You refuse, and the doing his bidding could be something like, okay, hey, uh, take your vax, take this vaccine, you know, shoot in your body this foreign element from this new technology that we've never utilized in mass before, right? Uh, you know, you're know, you gonna be the guinea pig, right? Uh, and it, But if you don't, you lose your job. If you don't, you lose your house, right? And that's another aspect of this too, is that uh, the way that we live today ha has actually guaranteed, almost guaranteed that we're going to return to a, a, a state of new slavery, right? The new slavery, right? When you have, um, when you have finance, you have money that that you can create out of thin air, right? But of course, in the control of the bank, the bankers themselves, you know, that they have an unlimited supply of money, right? Right. The U.S. is so the dollar itself is the world reserve currency, you know, and so, but you know, people, some some people believe that eventually that's going to come to an end. That 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 time is going to be over eventually, right? That the U.S. is going to be that that they believe that U.S. right now is on a uh, a decline is descending right now, right? But at any rate, the bankers have unlimited access to money. They can get and buy whatever they want, right, with that money, right? You know, and so, but at the same time, they'll give you money and then charge you interest. They give you a loan, charge your interest on it. Give you credit, charge your interest on it. And we live in these societies where most of the luxuries that people enjoy were purchased on credit. When you really think about it, a 30 year or 30 years to complete the payment of your home is really crazy, right? Why is it? Why does it take me 30 years to become a homeowner, right? They'll tell you from the beginning, yeah, actually you own the home right now, but you have to pay us back, right? But it's going to take you 30 years to do so. And we're going to, right? well, imagine this, an individual who has a 30 year mortgage, uh, has one or two car notes, has student debt, perhaps even paying the the um, tuition for one or two of their children. And they're working one or two jobs, right, to make ends meet, to make sure that they can continue to pay these bills. And then all of a sudden we have this big ca 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 uh, ca catastrophe like, you know, COVID, the lockdowns. And it's like, oh my God, right? You know, um, if I don't do what they say, I'm gonna lose my house, I'm gonna lose my cars, I'm gonna lose, you understand what I'm saying? So it's, it's really like, it was, it's very diabolical. They really thought this thing through, right? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, um, the nine to five itself, that in itself, uh, that people believe that to have a job is a human right. But no, having a job is not a human right. Having access to food and drink may be, right? You know, I mean, we know that there was a time when most people, they either forage for their food or they, they plant it and grow it with their own food. Uh, you know, they didn't need um, a nine to five. We've mm -hmm. been duped into believing that to be rich means to have a lot of cash, yeah. right? But to be rich actually is to have a lot of wealth. But yeah. people, again, they get, well, okay, you just said the same thing. No, I didn't say the same thing, right? Uh, having cash doesn't mean that you have wealth. You have a lot of cash doesn't mean you have, have wealth. Wealth is what you purchase with your cash, right? So so the land that you that you purchase your home that you purchase, your clothing, your furniture, your food, your drink, you know, your livestock, your whatever it may be, whatever you have. If you have those things, then you're rich. You have the things, you're rich. But we've been duped into believing that if we don't have cash, we're not rich. So the person will come, a person may own like two, three acres of land, and then someone comes, hey, I'll offer you uh, $5 million for that land. And oh, oh, I'm rich now. No, you're not, now you're poor. Because all it takes is one crash of the stock market or the, the crash of this system, right? And then that money means nothing after that. It means mm -hmm. nothing. 
You know, mm-hmm. you can't do anything with it. It's worth n- nothing anymore, right? The government's existence and its stability is what props it up, right? So, so fundamentally, um, if you are living in a precarious, in a precarious situation like that, where you're just steeped in debt, then you have made yourself vulnerable to the control and the seduction and the, and the enslavement of the Messiah the job, right? You know, so, mm-hmm. so and as, as so, so I see as a, as a reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he announced in the Quran that he declares war on those people who charge riba, right? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, or in the, in the hadith of the prophet, that, you know, even for those who actually pay it, right? You know, of course, we know that, you know, we have to make some very difficult decisions from time to time, but I think that's an important thing for us to to reflect upon. Mm-hmm. Right, so, so again, you have, I would say that when it comes to those people who we should really be keeping our eyes on with respect to support for the establishment of this system of, ensla- uh, of slavery. We need to keep our eyes on the banks, we need to keep our eyes on the, the think tanks, we need to keep our eyes on the ma- massive, the ma- major corporations, right? So for the banks, the, the central bank of all central banks is the BIS or the, the uh, Bank of International Settlements. Um, and you have the IMF, the Interna- International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, Federal Reserve Bank in the US, Right. These it's interesting that as as we try to sort of to recover, so to speak, from what is not really admitted to be a recession. Right. That the the banks have in concert with one in concert with one another have have been raising interest rates. I mean, how does that happen that all the banks are raising interest rates at the same time if there is not some sort of collusion? if there's not some sort of consolidation involved, right? Or even if we say all it is is um, interest con- interest uh, uh, convergence, you know, the interest converts, therefore this is why they're doing it, you know, so it benefits everybody, right? You know, but again, I think that, you know, the standing orders of ev- everyone else in society, they start with the banks. That's where they begin. We understand the banks. I think you can understand everything else that's happening in the world, right? Not not down to every single detail because their power is not absolute, right? It's not absolute power, right? But you know, but it's a, a lot of what we see. Rather, it it's, it's, it starts with the banks, and then again, we have the United Nations Council of Foreign Relations. We saw what happened with the WHO, the World Health Organization, during COVID, you know, and how they colluded. With uh, with people, uh, well established people, Black Black BlackRock, for instance, when it comes to transnational corporations who invest a lot in these big big companies like BlackRock, uh, Vanguard as well, they have massive budgets. You know, much more than they're like a country by themselves, right? Ten trillion dollars, eleven trillion dollars budget, and they choose different projects to invest in. Now, it doesn't mean that they have absolute control over companies. They for, say, for instance, if we come back to Bud Light or like Target, that example, um, they may have, let's say, Black, let's say Vanguard or BlackRock has seventeen percent um, um, ownership in in those companies, right? Let's say they have seventeen percent ownership. Okay, there's still uh, 83% owned by other people. Mm -hmm. But we have to understand, too, is that if another company only owns 1% of Target or Bud Light and Vanguard owns 17%, then Vanguard has much more leverage than the companies that own 1% or 2%. Mm In other words, so if, if BlackRock steps in and says, hey, you have to sell these um, androgynous toys to these kids. You have to sell this clothing, right, which obscures gender to these children. Now, you have to, um, you have to do an ad with, with an individual, you know, who is of, uh, you know, who claims that he's a woman when we actually know he's not a woman, right? Or you have to hire this individual who's not even qualified to even hold that position, you know, simply because of their color or because of their gender. That BlackRock or all the other companies, they have massive control, massive power, right? Massive control. So in other words, it's, it's almost as if like you have to pity the corporations a little bit mm. because you know they themselves are trying to survive, but at the same time, they don't need that much money, right? They don't have to compromise. They don't have to compromise, you know, 
But you're also talking about companies who employ a lot of other people, right? Who pay taxes and, and also they provide for their families. So it's not easy to get out of that, um, that type of dilemma, the type of dilemma, right? You know, on the other hand, with respect to resistance, there does seem to be something happening internationally with respect to finance and banking, right? So, so we see that, of course, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of problems, a lot of conflict between Russia, China, uh, and then the West, Western countries, America, and other countries, you know, from Western Europe, right? So, and it seems, you know, and I could be wrong about this that. Fundamentally, there is a bipolar world that's being created right now, and it's starting in the finance uh, sector, and it relates to the matter of cryptocurrency, right, and uh, just electronic money, right. You know, in other words, there's a there's a an alliance called BRICS, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, right, uh, which is its own block, right, economic block, which being formed. And is attempting to undermine Western uh, hegemony, right? You know, they're trying to be said, no, no, we're no longer going to be under Western hegemony, right? They've actually had a stated goal that they want to become um, completely uh, uh, off dependency of the U.S. dollar in three years from now. Right? Really? Gosh. Right? Three years and no more U.S. dollar dependency, right? You know, and so while you find Western Europe and the United States, they want to go green when it comes to these matters of the climate. Um, you have countries like Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Iran, all of them applying for membership into BRICS. And also, uh, supposedly, they're supposed to actually fit, make it official in January of 2024 that they are going to be part of BRICS. Right. So, and it makes sense when you think about it from the economics perspective. Right. It's a, so you're telling me that you want to rid the world of fossil fuels. And the thing that my country relies upon the most for its own stability is fossil fuels. Why would I stay on your block? Mm -hmm. Why would I not want to join the other block? Right. And so it seems that that's what's happening, right, when it comes to this, this, this matter here. And then you can't even have, you can't have green energy without fossil fuels, to be totally honest, right? You know, that they're going to continue to, you know, well, there's, there's a way around it, of course. If, if you go nuclear completely, you know, at least this is my understanding. Again, listen to experts, right? just experts that I'm persuaded by, not maybe not the ones that others are persuaded by, you know, that if, if we were to rely upon nuclear energy, all the energy would be clean, right? Yeah, but no, but they don't want to do that. You know, they, they, you have to take these drastic measure, measures, these austerity measures, which are actually going to do nothing more than make life for the vast, more difficult for the vast majority of people on the planet, while the people who are making those decisions, they'll continue to be able to do the things they want. Like they want us to eat bugs and while they eat meat. They're gonna keep it, they don't want you to eat meat, but they want us to eat bugs, you know, bug protein as opposed to meat protein, but they're gonna still have access to it. They don't want you to travel, right, uh, that much, but they're gonna continue to, to, to travel in their jets. Right and and pollute the environment. Right and again, as Muslims, we should be in favor of reducing our net negative effect on the planet. Right, you know that is Islam. You know we should not be polluting the water. We should not be polluting the air. Um, we should not be over consuming. Right, and, and so definitely there's a problem with our civilization. Right at the pro at, at, at the moment. Right. But I, but I do think it's, an, it's important for us to understand that the so-called solutions being proposed to resolve the problems really are not basing those decisions on real science. Mm. You know, because there's no real information that tells us that this way we're actually going to, to save the earth, right? You know, because... Uh, again, you know, we don't have to get too much into detail with that. But but anyway, the whole point is is, is, is that there is a, a block moving in um, contradistinction or opposing block against the Western block, right, who wants to have their own particular world, their own independent economic system. They kicked or removed um, Russia from the SWIFT 
uh, um, a money transfer system. And then they say, okay, well, okay, we're going to go in this other direction right now, right? And so, and so more and more countries are are embracing what they call central bank central central bank digital currency, central bank digital currency. And again, the banks at the top have already made this, the central banks have already made the decision for everyone that this is the direction that we're going. That in the future we're going to have programmable pro programmable money. We're going to have money where we can be able to we're going to know uh, everything that you buy. Everything that you sell, right? Uh, we're going to have access. There's not going to be as much privacy, or at least that's what it appears. You know, it gives it it opens up uh, the uh, the capacity to do that. You know, to to be, to be much more intrusive on people's lives, and they can they can actually turn off your money, like. Uh, and this will happen once uh, cash is actually uh, phased out. Like um, a couple weeks ago, I believe it was one of the. The uh, heads of the of the EO, I forget it's this woman, I forget her name. She came out and made an announcement about how the U U European Union central bank digi digital currency is on the move, right? And she also said after that, you know, cash is here to stay. Now, I think her saying that is important in that um, there are a lot of people who are very skeptical about the intentions of, of, of these people said, so why would we want to phase out cash? You know, cause if you phase out cash and I, and all my cash is all, di all digital, you know, then I won't be able to eat or you could decide that I can't eat. Right. So the cash is here to stay. We have to say that now, but yeah. eventually they're probably going to phase out cash. At least this is the fear unless we're able to pass legislation that ensures that people uh, are able to maintain their privacy uh, and then there's a way to ensure that that particular rule or law is enforced, right? Because I think you can't stop the technology. The technology is is here, right? It's here and, and, it, and it's happening, right? But again, another way that the Dajjal, the Dajjalic system can actually enslave the rest of us. So we were talking about before, I was talking about before about like just debt and credit debt, right? Just by itself. Uh, we saw what they did to the truckers and uh, in Canada during the, the uh, COVID lockdowns, the trucker revolt, right? What did they do? They shut down their money. Now, and that's even without having a, a CBDC or a central bank digital currency, right? You know, but they were able to do it. They can do it now, but they are just targeted, you know? So everybody's like, hey, well, it's not me, you know? So who cares, right? But once, you know, everyone is in a situation, that precarious situation, uh, what happens then? Um, um, what will they impose upon us? What will they demand of us? And then tell us that if you don't conform, you're going to be locked out of society. You're going to mm -hmm. be locked out of society. You know? So, so again, you know, again, it's 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 speculation. It's speculation on my part, and I want that to be totally clear. You know, but I do think that um, we can you know, do a lot to connect some of the dots. You know that we that that are out there. You know, so. There was um, this is something that I made reference to uh, some time before. There was a an operation called Operation Mockingbird, um, which was uh, a CIA operation, which started apparently started um, after World War II, uh, when the Cold War with Russia or the Soviet Union had begun, and the fundamental goal was for them to um, to manipulate the American public into believing pretty much whatever they want to. In other words, they, their plan was to take over the media, educational system, educational institutions and things like that in order to um, sort of get Americans to believe whatever uh, they wanted so in order for them to go along with everything uh, that they wanted. It was exposed and they had hearings about it um, in the, uh, the 60s. Um, it's not something known that much in public, but I personally believe that that this, this operation has expanded and perhaps all media outlets which are legacy media outlets actually are controlled um, controlled by like the federal federal um, government. On, on that point, I mentioned just briefly earlier on about uh, the alternative media. And one of the most remarkable things, I don't know what you think, uh, recently, the recent year or so, is Elon Musk's takeover yeah. of Twitter. Mm -hmm. well, we used yeah. to be called Twitter, it's now X, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, th there seems to be an extraordinary blossoming of free speech. Now, not all of this speech, uh, communications, tweets, mm -hmm are pleasant or posts i think called now. right um, but nevertheless it opened up this incredible space where mm -hmm. freedom of thought and freedom of expression and uh seemingly un unauthorized and unapproved of ideas are now given 
open expression online in in instantly accessible ways globally. Uh, I, I mean, do you think this is a very positive thing? Is this is it now an alternative media that where we can actually get our real news from, so we're not so dependent on the the so called legacy media? Yeah, I definitely believe so. I think I think Elon is a hero. Um, I don't know what things may look like in the future. You know, if, if he may change or they may find a way to wrestle um, X away from him. You know, yeah. but but I do think it was a very brave thing for him to do. Uh, and I personally believe that had he not done that, we wouldn't see this level of um, of outrage about what's happening with the Palestinians. Um, and, and, and what I mean by that is because there's so much information available on X that Facebook and YouTube almost have to allow for it to be shown because they will be exposed completely, you know, as just simply agents um, of, of the system, right? You know, they are, <laughs> but I do think it's because of th these things being allowed by uh, Elon Musk on, on Twitter um, that has been, been possible. In addition to the fact, of course, there's been um, some efforts um, in society uh, uh, to actually uh, uh, sort of raise awareness about what's happening to the Palestinians, right? So, um, I think because like cause typically what happens with Instagram or Facebook uh, or even YouTube is that those that type of information gets get it gets um, censored, right? Yeah. But and what's really interesting about Elon too is since he's actually taken over and adopted a different attitude and also exposed uh, FBI collusion with the former owners of Twitter, uh, that he has a lot of troubles now, right? You know, everybody celebrated him before. Everybody loved Elon. Right? Now, you know, the left hates him. You know, at least many people on, on the left hate, hate him. Uh, they try to claim he was a racist. And then now he has a lot of legal trouble, trouble too. You know, the, the Security and Exchange uh, um, Committee of the U.S., the government's coming after him, trying to sue him for something. There are other people trying to sue his, not only Tesla, they're trying, they're trying to sue Tesla, trying to uh, sue, uh, sue his ex, uh, sue ex, I mean, Twitter. They're trying to sue um, the SpaceX as well, right? So so he has litigation against him, you know, as a result of this. And I think it's because it's, it's the way their way of trying to punish him for not conforming. Right, because mm -hmm. it's, it seemed to me that he's actually gone through somewhat of an evolution and that it seemed that he was pretty much on board with the globalist agenda, mm -hmm. right, at one point. Because he believes in, um, he believes in UBI, universal basic income, right? Yeah. In other words, you know, and, and I don't think that's really a, a knock against him. So he believes that because technology is moving so fast, so quickly, that a number of jobs are going to be obsolete, you know, very soon, right? Um, uh, you know, there's a prediction that even by, well, between 2025, 2030, about 47 percent of of jobs, uh, you know, going to be taken over by like machines. Right. At least that's at least the, the goal that they have in mind. This is mentioned in the book um, the, um, uh, for the first uh, the fourth industrial Re revolution, fourth industrial revolution by um, Klaus Schwab, who is the founder of the uh, World Economic Forum. Right. But um, but basically. Uh, Elon seemed to have shifted a bit, right? You know, so I remember there was a a world government forum that was held somewhere, and they invited him to speak. And so when he actually went to speak, he told them that, well, I actually think this whole idea of world government is probably not a good thing. <laughs> he says, you know, because when we look historically, there have always been um, countervailing civilizations. Right? He talked about the Ottomans against the Roman Empire, and he, so he brought up these things and. And, and so he's speaking to these globalists and he says this to them. Um, his ESG score actually was lowered, you know, as a result of mm -hmm. <laughs> some of his, of his positions, right? Uh, I noticed how he took a big hit, didn't he, in the last year, advertising wise, because right. of uh, was it ADL in America, yeah. the Anti Defamation League, yeah. um, yeah. which uh, uh, was obviously a, a pro Zionist, very militant group, right. uh, basically right. campaigned to. Uh, stop companies uh, advertising or, or be or be labeled anti-Semitic. Um, yes. uh, it's yes. an extraordinary thing that I didn't realize it had such a huge impact in this campaign yeah. to yeah. disinvest or not advertise with uh, Twitter uh, X. Um, it had a big impact, and 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 he's actually started to 
uh, I, there's a, an, an Irish guy, um, Keith Woods, I think. Uh, he's mm-hmm. not that well known, but he's he's becoming more popular. Uh, he, he actually liked or retweeted something he said. You can look up Keith Woods and see who he is. Mm-hmm. But he ain't mainstream, that's for sure. Right, right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Very, very critical of uh, ADL uh, himself and, and has exposed a lot of their activities behind the scenes. So, yeah, he, he seems to move from this kind of globalist position to some very alternative uh uh, almost risky positions, seemingly. Right. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, a very interesting evolution in his personality, his his positioning vis-a-vis mm-hmm. the issues. I think. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So I mean, there's there's this. You know, he's he's very. I would say he's 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 been very heroic um, right. in a lot of the things he's he's done, and um, I do think that Muslims should should um should should thank him right for that. You know that we should be happy with what he's done. Of course. You know, you know. Naturally, there are going to be things that we don't agree with that Elon does. But Elon is—he's a big thinker. He's making some very big decisions. We have to respect uh, his allowance for a lot of the material we've seen come out about Gaza on on uh, on Facebook. And and this time around, is we've seen these conflagrations more than more than once. You know, but it just seemed like this time around that things are a whole lot different. You know, for the Israeli, I'm not sure if the future bodes well for the Israelis and for mm-hmm. the state of Israel in light of what we're seeing now. Because in the in the U.S., half of the U.S., half of the Democrats, the base are pro-Palestinian, and the conservatives are not pro-Palestinians. They actually are. They're pro. I guess you say they're pro-Israeli, but the base are Trump's base, and so. That's in America's first base, you know. So their attitude generally is that, okay, yeah, we like, we trust, we, 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 we support Israel against Hamas. However, we want, um, want people, our politicians to focus on America. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's America first. Israel is not the 51st state. Yeah. Even when I was in California at the end of the year, you know, in San Francisco, extraordinary homelessness and suffering and poverty. Yeah. Uh, and yet uh, America is very happy to send billions and billions to other countries in military aid and other kind of aid. So they seem, yeah, I, I sort of, a lot of these people in, in your country are seeing this, uh, mm-hmm. this discrepancy and not liking giving so much money to overseas ventures. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and not feeding the poor and 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 so on in, in at back home, um, and I, I can see the logic to that. Yeah, yeah. And then then on top of that, I've never seen so many Jews come out in support of the Palestinians. Right, right. there are so many this time around. A lot of Jews, rabbis, and Orthodox, non-Orthodox Jews. A lot of a lot more. Uh, you know, of uh, even in this situation, um, uh, actors. A number of the actors have come out, you know, in support of the Palestinians. You know, so I don't think, think the future bodes well for the state of Israel, right? You know, but but again, it's it's part of uh, that man- manipulation which is there, and what's really interesting too. There's there's a hadith that uh, actually I skipped over, um, which uh, it, it brought to mind the discovery uh, of of oil um, in Gaza, right? Okay. And there's this hadith here. This uh, it said that um, that Yamur al Khabir Khariba fi Yatul Laha Akhriji Kunuzaki fi Sitbaa wa Kunuzu Haki Ya Asib al Nahal. It said this hadith in Sahih Muslim and Tirmidhi that the Dajjal he will pass by a demolished um, a, 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 a demolished area, and then he will say to it, uh, "Bring out your treasures for me," and then these treasures, its treasures will follow him like drones of bees, right? Right, and so again, if that could be literal, we could take that literally, but if it's a figurative uh, reading as well, it could mean something like, okay, well, we're going to get rid of, we'll move all of these Palestinians out of Gaza, and then we're gonna start drilling. We're gonna start drilling, you know? And so he, he's an order, it's gonna be a demolished, uh, demolished um, small you know, area, right? You know. And and then they're gonna be able to extract this is his treasures after that. Allah Adam, right? You know, so I mean another area of consolidation we didn't talk about is the issue of food consolidation, you know. But I mean briefly, you know, I'll try to I'll try to wind this down. I don't want to keep keep you keep your audience for too long, but but um the 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 purchase of land, right? That's another area of consolidation involved, right? If you go to the website of the Madison Trust Comp- Trust Trust Company, they list like the people, those who own the most land in the world, 
Right. And of course, I think the number one <laughs> landowner, farmland owner, is King Charles III and the British royal family. Well, I didn't know that. Actually, that's news. Okay. <laughs> and so, and then it said the second largest landowner is a Catholic church. Less surprising. Right. Mm -hmm. And and the thing is interesting about the, those two by themselves is that King Charles and the Pope are they're on um, they're on the side of the. 2030 agenda of the World Economic Forum, you know, that they actually are in favor of the changes, the drastic changes that they actually want to make, which actually actually want to cause major upheaval in the lives of average people, uh, as but but not, you know, of course, not not the rich, right? Because the Pope himself is, you know, very much a um, you know, a believer in climate change, and he talks about um wanting to uh you know to to actually expand government power or rather to you know, make much more of a socialistic type of existence, things like that. Um, and because the World Economic Forum in, in this one book by Klaus Schwab, which he wrote in, and uh, this is in 2000, COVID-19, The Great Reset, that two important things come out, or perhaps three things, important things come out of that book, I would say. One is that he began the book by saying that um, that people are waiting for things to return to normal. And he says, um, if one, one were to ask me when are things going to return to normal, I would respond to them by saying never. Is that they're not going back to the way things were prior to COVID, right? Um, and um, he, said, he, he actually calls it the new normal. And this, he, this is really common for people to say during, during the COVID years. Uh, the, the new normal. This is the new normal. We have to get uh, um, accustomed to it. And also the phrase build back better. Also, that comes from that World Economic Forum. Right? So so uh, King Charles, when he was Prince Charles, used to, that was one of his slogans too, build back better. A lot of U.S. politicians, um, Trudeau in Canada, right? The Australian governors, all of them build back better. Biden, build back better. Everyone's part of that agenda, the build back better agenda, right? Mm -hmm. So so it's it's related to this same agenda to change uh, related to the UN sort of you know sustainability goals that they have in mind. But again, that's one issue. The second issue is that he said that um, you know I'm paraphrasing him, but fundamentally he said that in order for things to change and become better, that is important for us to reduce freedom of of populations, and then three. Uh, need to increase government power, right? So mm -hmm. it's a return to big government, right? Mm -hmm. right. And he talks about, and there's another book of his, it came out in the following year, um, The Great Narrative. The Great Narrative, this is this book here, same yeah. color, right, like that one. So this this is largely about how to sell climate change to the mm -hmm. world, right? You know, but uh, one particular point he makes, which I think actually is a valid point in the book, um, he's quoting a Harvard Harvard economist. I forget his name, you know. And but basically, he says that you know that that we live in a trilemma, right? The world lives in a trilemma, not dilemma, but trilemma, right? A trilemma between um, um, national statehood, globalism, and democracy. And he says that all three of these cannot all three of these things cannot exist all at once. Only two of them are possible to exist at any given time. So he says that if we if we honor or we value national statehood and democracy, then we're going to have to sort of curtail globalism. You know, we have to turn our backs on the global uh, economic you know sort of relationships. Uh, if we say that okay, well we want democracy and globalism, then the nation state it, it disappears. You can't have you know the nation state either if you have democ the global and democracy, uh, and then the third option was um, was uh, democracy. Uh, I, I think I mean national statehood and democracy, and then globalism and democracy, and then the third one would be what? <laughs> because we um, we're talking about uh, I can't remember the third one. Yeah, but. It, it, uh, but anyway, the whole point is that you know that all the all the two of these three, only two of these three, can actually work at any given time, mm -hmm. at any given time, right? So, so I think that's an important thing to reflect upon, in that some of the things that are coming 
they're in some ways a natural part of our social evolution, I guess you would say, right? Right. So technology is not inherently evil, right? Mm. Um, I mean, some forms of technology could be, but like, but not most forms of technology are not inherently evil, right? But with these technologies, like AI, deep fakes, and things like that, um, technologies that help you control people's money, uh, technologies that allow for you to to uh, turn people's farmland into deserts or to make it rain, right? In the wrong hands, mm-hmm. right? These are extremely extremely dangerous, right? You know, mm-hmm. but. Uh, and I, I guess what I would say that the, the greatest danger that any of us um, have is is the danger of not having good command of our of our own um, own appetites and our own emotions, right? You know, but you know, but also uh, being informed and understanding that this would be a great fit. Now, when it then it comes, the thing what that what the reason that so many people will accept and embrace the Masih al would be because it sounds so persuasive, that it sounds so good. Right. Who wouldn't want that? Right. And what I was trying to do, you know, I think it's probably a good place to perhaps maybe wind down. You know, I didn't go through my entire PowerPoint, but but I do think um, I've made um, a number of points which hopefully Mm. are points of good reflection. But I've tried to sort of identify the areas where it's important for people to actually uh, keep their eyes on, you know, the banks, the transnational uh, organizations the think tanks, uh, what are they doing? What decisions are they making? What type of pressures are they placing on the rest of the world? You know, because again, the banks are at the top of the food chain and realistically any government that exists can't really do anything without the support of the banks, without the support of those people who who actually control the money. Uh, And, um, you know, but again, there's a resistance. Resistance is happening. uh, And there we've been told that, you know, there is hope. Uh, that uh, the army of the Mahdi and Asa bin Maryam, you know, as well, right? But but you have non-Muslims too, non-Muslims who are waking up, who are awake, and they're very much um, aware of what's happening, what what people are trying to do to them. But we just hope that things can be done to mitigate uh, the severity of all these things. And and I guess guess I would say that the best thing we can do is live a debt-free life, uh, try to... Um, resort back to the old ways of, of living and, and perhaps farming more, um, being becoming self-sufficient. These patterns of behavior, these ways of living have been tried and tested by our species for millennia, right. you know, and just to throw them all away on, on some kind, because the change is good automatically by definition, mm-hmm. it is a great folly. It's a great madness, really, because there's a reason why the traditional ways of doing things have been so successful and endured is because they work and they actually enhance human flourishing and right. fulfillment. Um, right, right. Yeah, no, I, I think what you've done now in, in, in this presentation is to give uh, flesh, I suppose, or you've given political um clothing to the the perhaps more theological language of the mm-hmm. the the, the jajal, uh yeah. a, 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 in ways which are very helpful and perhaps uh, uh, alerted us awakened us to possibilities mm-hmm. uh which may be which may be under underway at the moment or may happen in the future so we're not ca- caught off guard or un- unaware of, of what uh organizations are, are, are consciously working right Great mm-hmm. uh, in the world, so I think that's a great service, and uh, I hope people have followed what you said all the way through. Um, to just a fi- final point: are, are there any further resources or books or, or yeah. um, that you might recommend that people to follow through on this afterwards? Yeah, um, I'm just I'm gonna just just uh, pull up my slides again on the oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah the uh, final slide. This is. Uh, the final slide I have these are these are important books um, just to get an idea of the I get well to, to understand the ideas of those at the top you know what what sort of things that they they have in mind for the future of the world uh, the World Economic Forum is an extremely important uh, and okay. central uh, think tank right mm-hmm. and they've had influence you know, on presidents prime ministers and even admittedly so, right? Um, they um, they are connected with you know the UN. They're connected with um, those uh, the banks, the central banks. 
Um, and so typically what they say is going to happen probably will happen, you know, and that's, of course, notwithstanding some level of resistance from other powers who may be just as strong, as strong as they are, you know, like the Chinas, the Russias, um, others like that. You know, but I do think it's important to understand, you know, at least uh, what the narrative is to understand, um, like, for instance, in the COVID-19, the Great Reset, um, they admitted, he admitted more than once in the book, he said, well, COVID, you know, this disease is not that big of a deal. It's not, you know, that serious of, it's not going to be, it's not going to be on the level, it was even before everything even happened, right? It's like, uh, it's not going to be on the level of like the uh, major plagues of the past, uh, but it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to accelerate our agenda. That's really what this is all about, is that they took advantage of this, right, to accelerate their agenda to change the world um, um, by you know, increasing government power, reducing freedom of uh, people's freedom, um, and then um, uh, trying to further develop other mechanisms to, uh, I guess you would say, Control, right? Control the population, you know, to ensure that they don't, uh, you know, it doesn't escape their their control in the future. Along those best, you know. But um, again, I'm not trying to demonize the founder or or the necessarily the organization, the World Economic Forum. But uh, they may genuinely believe the things that they say. But it's hard for me to believe that <laughs> that many of the people who actually are working and trying to implement the agenda um, mean nothing more than to um, find a, a better way to control populations on the planet well, and, and a lot of those best, you know, so I, I would recommend get those books. You know, it's nothing, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, revolution, I think it probably the most important of those three. Uh, the others are easy read, easier reads. Uh, there is nothing really too technical in them. You no, know, but it's just really interesting and convenient that they were released uh, during the COVID years, you know, COVID-19, the great reset, Think of the Great Reset. He's talking about economic reset, talking about social reset, talking about political reset. All right, so those things are in motion right right now. Uh, and then great narrative again for a better future. Again, what is uh, what, what 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 you know the 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 world is supposedly uh, under threat of climate apocalypse. You know, but to be totally honest, at least from what I've seen, what I've studied, and the experts that I listen to, uh, I, I see it more so as a ploy. To um, uh, you know, to transfer large amounts, sums of money, back over once again to the same people who actually put us in the situation where there supposedly is some particular threat, right? You know, so the same people, the big oil companies, uh, the fossil fuel com companies, they're the ones who are going to get those big contracts uh, to actually go green, right? Well, so as uh, and, and and at the end of the day, we're going to be convinced that okay, oh, we live in a, a better world. Uh, but we actually may not be living in a better world. And, um, you know, even like you know, electric vehicles, you know, people will talk about, okay, this is greener energy, but, you know, they have to mine cobalt and cobalt causes a great amount of um, of environmental destruction, right? So, and, and that's not talked about enough either, right? So at any mm -hmm. rate, I, I think that that'd probably be a good place where people can start and then just follow the, uh, um, uh, the feeds uh, of, of live feeds of, of these organizations go to the UN as well. Read the uh, read the UN's um, their uh, sustainable development goals uh, and some of the things they read are actually some unbelievable. But you know you can see the connections and then and then also look into the financial sector as well. Look what was happening with money, right? The evolution of money is is happening right now, and I think that most people don't realize you know, what type of future we might find ourselves in in a few years from now, because <laughs> it is possible that quickly that things can change. And of course, they should follow you on Twitter because you're very active there and uh, Facebook and mm -hmm. YouTube. Uh, you give regular cookbooks and lectures and talks. Um, so you're very active on, on many platforms. So basically, mm -hmm. people should follow you there to keep up to date. And I'm sure you'll be making future contributions on this subject uh, as it moves forward and inshallah so uh thank you very much um dr abdullah ali for your uh, your time your expertise fascinating insights um as you say some of this is conjectural of course you're not you're mm -hmm. not being dogmatic you, but you are outlining possibilities scenarios processes mm -hmm. so that we might think be, be more aware of what's going on e e even though we may not always know what's 
the future holds, of course. Um, but uh, but we can at least be more aware of what's going on. So thank you uh, very much indeed. Really appreciate it. Until yeah, next. Thank you, Paul. Uh, appreciate you bringing me on. <laughs>